All right. Um, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Marketing 360. This is lecture six. Uh, that's fine. Um, I really hope this recording works because I've been having some troubles and um, I appreciate everyone's patience. I know it took a little bit longer to get this lecture up than it should have. I kept recording to the cloud and it wasn't working. So um, let's hope this is the lucky the lucky recording. Um, anyways, let's get right into it. So this is lecture six. We're gonna be talking about questionnaire design today. Quick course schedule update. You know, we're in lecture six, still technically first week of April. Um, I've decided that I'll put that third exam up um, April 10th or 11th, and that'll stay open until like the 19th. Um, so it should give you enough time to watch this quick lecture that I'm trying to zip through and also give you enough time to take the test. If anyone has any, any scheduling conflicts or issues, please let me know. We'll we'll work it out. Um, I've been talking to a lot of you already, so hopefully um, it's not too big of an issue. So watch this lecture. Please, please, please read a chapter 11. Um, we're going to get zippy through this lecture and cover some of the most important stuff. But the chapter has a lot of good stuff in there as well that we'll not totally cover here. So please do that. And then, um, you know, just read through the last couple lectures, uh, PowerPoints and chapters to prepare for exam three. Again, I've I've sig uh, signified in the, the decks where, um, you know, there'll be a test item on it likely. So you should be able to focus on your studying a little bit. And then we're almost done with the course, only two more lectures. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have the last exam the end of April. And then your final will be that those couple of days in May. That's optional. All right, let me know if you have any questions. Let's get to it. So today we uh, are going to talk about questionnaire design, like I said. So we've already talked about the sampling, right? We know who we're going to survey, how many people, kind of how to develop that whole plan, what type of sampling, probability sample, non-probability sample, um, that kind of thing. Um, now we actually need to go about creating the questions that we're going to ask, right? Um, this is kind of a tricky part of our field because it's kind of an art, Right. There is a lot of science that goes into it and can help you um, decide and make choices and inform your path a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's it's just as much art as it is a science. And, you know, some of us can be amazing statisticians and amazing, um, you know, methodological researchers, but not great survey writers and and um, not great at the art of crafting a questionnaire. Um, and that's a tricky shortcoming. Right. Um so the best surveys are ones that are written with a lot of care and thoughtfulness and are a little bit more creative and more similar to an art. So we're going to talk about some specific, um, you know, scientific practices and methodological practices. Um, but again, like we're going to talk about how to kind of discuss, uh, sorry, design more of like an artist than a, a scientist. You know, okay, the textbook kind of talks a little bit more about building the questionnaire during the data collection phase. Um, it can also be designed in the research design phase. So sometimes, um, let's say that we're crafting a brief, right, for a RFP. Someone says, hey, like, I want you to do this project for us, either internally or as a vendor, and you build up a brief or a research plan, you know, for them. Sometimes they'll include the questionnaire in the plan and say, like, here's what we propose for the, the questionnaire, right? Should have these questions, should it follow this flow, should be about this long and kind of like we'll explain it. Uh, other times you're not ready for that and you need to kind of confirm the objectives and the timelines stuff before you're ready to actually write the questionnaire. So sometimes that, that will maybe come later on more similar to a data collection phase. So it kind of depends on where you're at. Um, but either way, uh, the kind of design will be the same. And then also just wanted to quickly remind you of our last lecture where we talked about uh, measurement and different levels of measurement and survey devices. So there's ratio, right? There's kind of those uh, really, really specific measurements like ratio, weight, height, um, age, et cetera. Then there's those intervals like a scale, um, ordinal, which is also can, can be a scale depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and then there's those nominal kind of like binary yes, no type of questions. So we're gonna use these elements and apply them to actually designing a questionnaire. 
So let's first talk about some of the, the actual specific question types, right? So you know about some of the scales and the level of measurement that we could use. But let's talk about some of the standard question types. So in general, you have two large buckets, right? You have what we call open-ended questions, which are essentially text write-in fields, right? Literally asking someone, what did you think about? Please tell me what you thought about this experience. And the respondent will literally type out their, their answers. Then you have what we call closed-ended questions, which are typically more quantitative in nature, that give respondents a finite list or a number of responses from which they can choose from, um, more like a select all that apply question or a multiple choice question, right? That's a closed-ended question. So two big buckets. Again, you should know this for the test. Um, pretty easy to understand, I think. Um, but let's talk uh, more about each one specifically. So open-ended questions. Again, they're kind of those type in qualitative based questions. There's not very many like variations of them. It's mainly text boxes and then a question that is related to um, the topic, right? So that's pretty standard. Uh, however, I wanted to also mention that at times a text box can actually be a quantifiable ratio level variable, right? If I want to say, hey, how old are you? And you have to type in 26 or you know, whatever, if I want to, hey, uh, you know, how many pizzas have you eaten in the last month? Open in a text box three, right? That's a ratio level scale data. So can be extremely quantitative, right? So um, it's when they start actually typing in text is when that turns into this open-ended qualitative type. In survey uh, tools, you can do what's called validation, which will say in this text box, the text must be numeric, right? And it must be a dollar sign or a number between zero and a hundred, right? So if you're asking what's your age, right? And you want someone to only be able to say a number in between, you know, zero and a hundred, right? Or 120, something like that. You're probably not going to have anyone close to hundred taking your survey, but maybe um, you would put that validation in there. So if they try to type in like, I'm 24, uh, that wouldn't work because there's validation on it to where it has to be numeric. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a just a specific thing I wanted to mention. Um, but for the most part, these open-ended questions are type in your response. There are people talking about, uh, you know, their feelings and their their thoughts, and it's kind of in their own words, which is nice. Um, it kind of provides that qualitative color that you would get from a focus group or end up interview, but you can do it in your survey. However, um, you know, it can be really difficult for us as researchers to interpret what they're saying. Um, it's hard to analyze it because you're going to get thousands of these open-ended questions and people responding to them. Um, you know, it, it may it's harder for respondents to, to fill out these questions, so it increases fatigue and makes, uh, you know, it harder on everybody. Um, so, yeah, there, there's definitely some... Uh, you know, distinct disadvantages of an open-ended question, but they definitely are something that I and most every research I know uses on the regular. So good to know. You know, and like I said, analysis of these can be really tricky. Um, so, you know, researchers often will make like a word cloud of the top mentioned words, right? So like if you ask like, you know, what do you think of our service, right? Having all those different like keywords, like, you know, I like app or like service or like, you know, having those kind of like hot words that come out in the qualitative is nice, can get really messy and hard to read and like not super interpretable. So it's definitely like needs to be caveated, but that is a big one. More often people will find important quotes to illuminate an insight or a point. So like, let's say you find that like, oh, a lot of the users are saying that, you know, the customer service is not, not great. You can pull out some specific quotes, quotes that really highlight or you know corroborate that that insight from the quote. So that's a more applicable way I would say to use it. Um, and then also just reading through all the insights can help build a story for a researcher, right? You don't have to necessarily illustrate all of the qualitative data, but it can just help you as a researcher understand like, okay, what are the themes? What are the major issues or concerns or or positives or like you know what are kind of what's the story for this data? Um, so that's a really good use of the qual stuff. There's some more advanced analytics you can do on it as well, like scraping, counting, you know, analyzing the sentiment of, of text responses and so on, but that's a little bit more down the line. 
Okay, so let's move on to closing the questions. Um, so closing the questions directly oppose open ended questions in that they are a canned list or like a predefined list of options that we give respondents and ask them, okay, you know, which of these, you know, do you feel um, best describe you or, you know, what are, you know, all the different types of list questions that we can ask. Um, so this is nice because it gives us an easy way to quantify our data, right? We can code this, we can count it, we can squeeze more analytical juice out of this type of data. Um, you know, we can really, it's just a lot easier for everybody. It's easier for them. All they have to do is click a few buttons or one button. And, you know, it's just a simpler method for everyone all around. It's, it's really the most common way to ask questions. Um, disadvantages, I think out of this list, um, the most glaring issue to me is that we as researchers have to decide what to put there, right? What the options should be. Oftentimes I will, if I'm doing a really big and important survey, I will do qual first and say, Hey, like, what are all of the things that you think about when you buy this product and hear people talk about it to generate the answer options for me. Right. As opposed to me being like, Oh, I think this is an, this is something, this is something like just based on my own experience. Um, it can be limiting. So that's one issue. This says that there's no freedom for a respondent to answer beyond the choices given. That is an issue if you don't include an other or a write-in response. So that kind of blends a closed open question, uh, sorry, closed ended question and an open ended question, right? Because you have the closed list and then you have an option that says other, please specify. You click that and it opens a text box for you where you can literally type in your, your response. So there, the freedom element can be solved or at least you know, mitigated a little bit. Um, so that's kind of like the the TLDR of closing the questions. Now we have four pretty big and popular types of closing the questions, right? We have what we call dichotomous questions. So that's offering two response options. I'll also call this one uh, binary sometimes. There's multiple choice questions where there's three or more alternatives or options for, to choose from. Um, in a multiple choice question, they are mutually exclusive and should be categorically exhaustive of all the responses. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Then there's multiple response questions, AKA select all the apply, um, check all that apply, you know, select whichever apply to you kind of situation. Um, each option represents a unique variable, which is going to important I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but yeah, remember that each selection is essentially a dichotomous question. And we'll go back to that in a second. Um, then we have our scaled questions, right? Which we talked all about last time and the different types of scales that you could use. Um, but again, that's a closing the question, right? Because we've decided what the options are for you and what the variables are within that scaled question. So let's quickly talk about each um, option. So the first option is um, you know, a dichotomous question or a binary variable. This is easy to answer for respondents, easier for us to analyze. Um, it produces nominal or categorical scale level data. So like, what's your gender, male, female? You know, yes, no questions. Which do you prefer, this or that? Um, very simple questions to answer and very simple to illustrate. So I put an example of a chart here, right? This is a pie chart just showing the number of, of responses in each category. 36 people said they're male, 32 people said they're female. Right, if you summed those two numbers and you uh, divided each out of that total, you'd have percentages. Right, pretty basic, pretty simple, easy for everyone to understand. Um, really common questions. Multiple choice questions. Right, so this is where you have those three or more uh, response options. They really need to be categorically exhaustive and and exclusive. Right, so you know, in this example on the left, how did you hear about our website? Right. We do have that kind of escape option that other please specify to kind of save our butts a little bit in a scenario where we don't cover everything, but it should cover all the options for you to have heard about our website, right? Or most of them. Um, and if it doesn't, your, your question is flawed or will not produce, because maybe you're missing a huge one that, you know, you don't know about and thus are going to miss out on in your interpretation of the data. Um, this type of question produces nominal data, just, just like we said earlier. And the chart on the right is just an example of the bar chart that we would use to you know, illustrate this data. So this one shows counts. Again, there's 52 people said less than six months, you know, six, uh, 
seven people said more than five years, so on and so forth. You can always, um, you know, reshape that that chart to be a percentage based, but this is just showing counts. Cool. All right, multiple response questions. So this is that check all that apply, select all that apply, you know, select whichever you feel suits you kind of question. So um, I have an example here on the right. It's very similar to multiple choice, and it's also similar to a dichotomous question, okay? Because in a select all that apply, you've got all these different options. And ultimately for each one, it's a yes, no question, right? User interface, did you like that? Yes or no. Sample data, did you like that? Yes or no. Documentation, did you like that? Yes or no, right? And so if you don't select it, that's saying no, right? If you do select it, that's saying yes. So in a way, it's kind of a list of dichotomous um, unique variables. Um, and that's important for the next slide I'm gonna show you in terms of data analysis. I'll also mention here that often you're gonna see none of the above um, as an option here. And that's to basically say like, I don't like any of these, or I don't know any of these, or none of these apply to me, um, you know, et cetera. Um, that always needs to be exclusive. And so what that means is when you click none of the above, all the other check marks will go away because none of the above means that that's the only one you can you can do. Um, so that's important. Also, I wanted to mention here that other can and often is at, also added um, in this question, right? So you'd have your check all that apply variables, then you'd have other, please specify, and then you'd have none of the above, right? Um, you click none of the above, you can't, all the other options get unselected. Um, and then others there, just in case you forgot one. So that's multiple response questions in terms of the theory, but let's look at one important part, which is the um, actually uh, the analysis of the question. So like I said, although it appears to be like multiple choice, there are actually a bunch of small dichotomous options, right? Um, each is a binary. In your data, when you export your data, there will literally be columns, right? For each very each option. And each option will either be zero or one, zero unselected, one selected. So in this example, in your data, there'd be one column for user interface. There would be one column for sample data. There'd be one column for documentation. And the data in those columns is zero and one. As opposed to a multiple choice question, there'll be one column that's just the question. And the answer in the data will be one of the one, two, three, four, five, whatever the options are for them to select, if that makes sense. So a um, little bit of a different analysis technique and can really confuse people uh, when the data is actually exported. Another very confusing part of Select, select all the apply questions is that there's kind of two different ways to interpret or analyze the data. There's what we call respondent data or choice data. So respondent data is when you actually say the denominator of the analysis is the total number of people who responded to the question. Okay. The other one, choice percentage, is the denominator is the total number of selections in the question. And the reason for that is that it's not one-to-one, -one, right? I'm an individual. I could select four options, right? It's not one person selects one. So the total number of selections is a lot larger than the number of respondents who actually responded to the question. So down here, I have an example. So let's say there, there's this question that we already showed you. 500 people filled it out, okay? So your total respondent base is 500. However, of those 500 respondents, there were 800 selections made, okay? Because each of those 500 people could select more than one. So on the right here, let's say that we want to look at the respondent percentage of this question. Let's say that we want to look at the percentage of respondents who selected user interface, okay? That would be 350 divided by 500, the total um, of the respondents. So 70% of respondents selected user interface. Inversely, for choice count, you would have 800 total selections were made. Regardless of how many respondents there were, 800 things were selected. How many of those things that were selected were user interface? 
right? So that would be 350 divided by 800 equals 43%, okay? That is a much less common scenario than respondent choice. Um, there's some examples where choice percent may, makes some sense when you're talking about product stuff, product features. Um, we won't get too far into it, but just know it's really important. This is something that I see a lot of new researchers don't understand. And I'm always fixing new researchers data by saying like, hey, you, you looked at the wrong data and your denominator is wrong. You need to be using respondent percentage. Okay, cool. Um, and then the last closing its question type is scaled. We already talked about scaled a lot. It captures like, you know, degrees of intensity or levels of intensity. Typically produces interval or ordinal data. Um, these take a lot more time to answer generally because there's a lot usually included. This um, question style down here is what we like to call a matrix table or a battery. Um, so these are really long usually and they actually like um, can be quite arduous for the respondent. Easy for us as researchers to analyze, honestly, but arduous for the, the respondent. Um, this We'll talk about this in a second, but this question usually screws up um, the usability on mobile phones because it's so wide that you know you might have to ask your respondent to flip your device over so it flips the page and is easier to understand um, or utilize some software hack to make this a little bit easier for respondents. So, you know, there is some word of caution with, with using scaled questions um, in terms of usability of the survey. Okay, this is brought up in your textbook and I do think it is important to consider. Position bias is a real thing in research. Um, you know, in a long list of these like multiple select options, um, depending on what comes first might influence their selections. And sometimes people just don't read the whole thing because they're trying to go fast or, you know, think that the one they answered covers their basis, although there might be another one they didn't think about. Um, they might just simply check the first one because it's the first one they see that applies to them. So um, one way to actually get around that is what we call choice randomization. And that's where the survey software will say, okay, like just to avoid position bias, we're going to randomly cycle through the order of these options so that position bias isn't an issue. Now, there are some scenarios where you don't want to do that, right? If you're doing like states, right? What state do you live in, right? It's easier for people to just have it be alphabetized so that they can quickly find their state. You don't want to randomize the number, you know, the, the order of states. Um, but oftentimes, like, it'll, it can be helpful in a big multiple choice list. Scaled questions, you know, you don't want to randomize the order of the, the degrees, right? So you don't want it to be strongly agree, somewhat disagree, agree, neutral, like you want them to be in the order that they should. However, you can flip the order, right, to avoid any bias, right? So if it starts with strongly disagree and goes to strongly agree, you can flip it to start at strongly agree and go to strongly disagree. And you can actually do that in a lot of survey softwares as well, just to make sure you're uh, mitigating any of that bias. All right, moving right along here. Um, question categories in the survey flow. So the textbook um, kind of like breaks down like some of the most common types of questions that are asked in surveys. You know, it's kind of a, a guide, kind of a typical thing. It can be completely different depending on the, the survey you're running, the category you're running the survey in, you know, what the goal is. But I think it's fair to kind of generalize as much as possible to make it helpful for, for everyone to understand. So textbook breaks down types of questions to demographic questions. Those are very real um, knowledge questions, which are like, you know, how aware are you of this? Um, do you know this brand? You know, how, how much do you do this thing? Um, and so on. Attitudes, you know, those feelings and emotions, a lot of those scale type questions that we mentioned before. Um, preferences, you know, what do people like kind of situation. Um, intentions, you know, why are you doing this thing? What's your goal? What motivates you? Situation. And there's the, those behaviors, which really seeks to understand like, you know, how often do you use this product? Where do you use this product? You know, what time of day? Those types of questions. So that's a pretty broad generalization of all of the questions in the universe that you can ask. Um, but I think this does cover most of the basis. Um, using those question categories, you can kind of start to think about, okay, I know what kind of questions I want to ask. I know how to ask them appropriately. I know the you know types of scales I'm looking for and the type of measurement I'm looking for, the type of data I need to produce, et cetera. 
Now we're going to start thinking about how to actually design the flow of the survey, right? Um, again, this is a rule of thumb, um, but on the right, there's kind of this flow chart that your textbook lays out, which I basically agree with, right? You've got your intro and your instructions, your screening questions, um, which again, we talked about screener before, but we'll mention it again. Those questions that we'll use to decide if someone should be able to take the survey or not, if they should qualify for the survey or not. Um, then we have our actual survey questions, kind of the meat and potatoes of the survey. And in that element, we can go back to this and say, okay, you know, our survey questions could include any of these types of question categories, right? Except for demographics, which typically goes last. However, oftentimes a lot of the demographic information that you want to capture will also be screening questions. So yeah, I want to know male, female, I want to know age, I want to know income, I want to know household um, composition. Oftentimes all four of those will already be asked in the screening questions because you don't, you know, you want to make sure to use those for quota sampling or for terms, whatever it might be. So the demographic information is usually mostly covered in screening, but if you have really specific ones that you want to know, like, you know, maybe, you know, education, maybe what type of industry, maybe, you know, a million other different de demographic type things um, could go at the end, should go at the end. And then you have your closing. Of course, your survey may be different. You may, you know, change things around based on the needs and you kind of have to be artisan with this. You know, it's not totally scientific, um, but we can kind of generalize things using this type of uh, flow chart here. Okay, I mentioned it earlier, um, but question formatting is super important because, you know, hey, it's 2024. We're taking surveys on, on our phones. We're doing everything on our phones. Um, the problem though, is that we don't make the surveys on our phones usually. We usually make them on, you know, laptops and desktops and browsers. Um, and so what looks good on our browser and our computer probably won't look good on our, on our mobile phone and vice versa. We've got to really make sure we are cognizant of designing for both or having things that show up only for a mobile device and only for a browser um, that meets the needs of the user. Um, the most impactful element will be the question types you use and kind of how you design your questions. So like I said earlier, um, a big matrix table of agreement scales will look really bad on your mobile phone. This is a perfect little GIF I have here showing how on the right is what it should look like based on your 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 web device or sorry, your your like laptop computer. On the left is a way that survey softwares will sometimes use to um, you know optimize the software to be on mobile. So instead of showing it like a big, you know, two uh, cross table like that, it kind of breaks down each answer option and allows someone to select, you know, the, the appropriate scale for each answer option. Um, so another big one is having a, a, a multiple choice question that's just too long. The list is huge. So you people have to scroll and scroll and scroll to get to all the options. Um, someone might accidentally click one. They might accidentally move forward in the survey. They might accidentally close their phone, you know, or the, the app, you know, who knows? Um, so really thinking about mobile is super important. And the textbook goes a lot into QA and testing your surveys, quality assurance. Um, I'm not going to talk about it too much because the book covers it and, you know, test your surveys, right? You got to test your surveys, send it to your friends, send it to your colleagues, um, test it a million times, go through every option, you know, test everything, test it on computer, test it on iPad, test it on phone, test it on print, you know, whatever it may be, test it everywhere, make sure it all looks good. Um, but definitely, definitely, definitely test it from a mobile view. Most tools, survey tools are, have options to do this and are pretty, you know, adept to being able to make the survey good for mobile. Um, but yeah, just double check, double check. Um, the last big issue that I wanted to mention with these surveys is don't make it too long. Surveys get out of hand really fast, especially when, you know, it costs a lot of money and you want to make sure and squeeze as much value out of the survey as possible and ask all the questions and your stakeholders and clients are going to be like, can we ask this? Can we ask this? Let's ask this. Let's throw it in there. You got to put your foot down. 
because, and you can explain to them, hey, I know you want to get a lot of the survey, but the more we put into it, the more likely all of it is going to become moot and people are going to get extremely fatigued and either drop off the survey or start answering poorly, giving us bad quality data. Or maybe they won't start the survey to begin with, right? Um, there's so many issues from that perspective that um, you know come with survey length. Maybe they'll never take a survey again, right? If you give them a 30 minute survey and they fill it out diligently, next time you send them one, they're probably gonna say, heck no, I don't have time for that. Um, so you gotta be careful with that. For us as researchers, it can get fatigued, right? Like I don't wanna have to analyze 30 questions. I don't want or a 30 minute survey. You know, I don't want to do all the data cuts. I don't want to QA all that data that as it comes in. Like it's just too much for both of us, the respondent and the researcher. Um, I also always ask myself, who's really taking a 20 minute survey? You know, let's say someone fills out the 20 minute survey. They're diligent. Uh, they read all the questions. It doesn't feel like a realistic behavior for the most part. So I'm always just suspicious of that type of data anyways, if someone is frequently willing to, you know, take a 20 minute survey. Um, the rule of thumb is no more than 10 minutes. That's again, very, very, very generalized, but I have found, and I think your textbook even says anything in the double digits, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have to really worry about data quality. You're going to have to really convince people to do it. Um, I would stick in the single digits as po if possible. Obviously, there's ways to say like, oh, you know, hey, this survey is a little bit longer. Let's give a bigger incentive to get people to do it, right? You could do that. Um, there's other ways you could try to get around it, but ultimately try not to go more than 10 minutes. And it'll be better for everyone. Um, quickly going to cover question writing tips, but again, please read your textbook. Chapter 11 has some good stuff in there. Um Properly phrased questions, right? They need to be clear, concise, they need to be understandable. They need not to bias the respondent, lead them on. Um, and then also needs to try to engage with respondents to make them interested, right? So some examples, like it needs to be free of jargon, right? Like if maybe like, I see this sometimes happen where like, you know, you as a researcher are so used to saying company acronyms and saying company terminologies that probably no one knows, right? Not, not the common person would understand what, you know, a DOD is or some very specific tech or, you know, company verbiage. So you got to make sure that that's not there. You explain everything. It can't be ambiguous. Um, it needs to be applicable to all respondents unless there's some sort of display logic on it, right? Like if you're going to say, hey, we saw that, you know, you work in advertising. What do you think about this? Well, Unless everyone works in advertising in your survey, you should only show that question to people who said that they work in advertising or don't show it at all. Um, more and more so questions should be written in a very conversational style, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of robotic AI based esque uh, survey question writing and the more and more artistic and creative you can be with it, the more engaging it'll be. Um, Questionnaire should have logical flow, which I actually critique a lot in my team's um, surveys. You know, if you're talking about music in this section, and then the next section you talk about podcasts, and the next section you come back to music, right? You should switch those sections so you're just talking about music, you know, and then you can move on completely from music to podcasts, something like that. Um, scale should be easy to understand. I think last time I showed you that little video of the office where Phyllis goes, oh, I thought strongly agree sounded more, you know, sounded better than extremely agree, you know, something like that. Like you got to make sure that to not trip people up that way. Um, okay. Either or questions. That's a big one. And I see this a lot still creep into surveys in the professional world. So let's say this is, this is one that, this is a real example. Um, we are always tracking things that have to do with music and podcasts and now audiobooks, Spotify. Um, we have a key metric that we want to, you know, understand how people feel about the discovery, being able to discover these types of content on Spotify. Well, one of the qu survey questions that we use to get at that is which of the following, you know, does, do you feel Spotify does helps me discover music? 
So we track that music um, trend over time. Well, recently someone added music and podcasts, right? I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to shorten the survey and, you know, get at discovery on Spotify. But the problem is, is that our music uh, offering and our podcast offering are very, very different. And so when someone selects that option, we don't know if they're talking about our music or our podcast. So it almost makes the question moot, right? So no either or questions. There shouldn't, there should almost never be an and in your, in your, you know, answer. Um, so please remember that it's really important. Um, questions should not be leading, right? You don't want to say like, Hey, how much do you like our services? Right. Like you're kind of leading on with that question of being saying you should like it. So how much do you like it? Right. Instead, say, how do you feel about our services and have all the options for them to choose? So just a couple tips. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing. It's in your textbook, but I do think a lot of this is important to make your your survey a little bit more engaging. Um, and I, like I said earlier, like surveys are more and more getting away from the robotic professional type um, lingo and more fun, more creative, more interesting, I think is always helpful. These are from your textbook, but I think these are all very, um, you know, interesting. So how much do you normally pay for milk? Three to 350, 350, 309, and so on. What's the problem with this? Right? There's two 350s. If I Pay three fifty for milk. Which one do I select? I can select either of them, right? So either or issue right there. Um, please indicate your level of satisfaction with the quality tools made by Craftsman. Very satisfied, satisfied, somewhat satisfied, dissatisfied. I see so much wrong with this question. There's only four statements, right? So there's no neutral point. It's not really unipolar at all. It's trying to be bipolar, but it's missing some. There's only four options. It also leads to the question, right? Like, you know, it kind of says like, please indicate your level of satisfaction, meaning you should be satisfied, right? Um, so that's an issue. Um, the very satisfied somewhat trio is a little weird to me. There should be only two. But anyways, so that's a few issues, issues with that one. Okay, how old are you? And how, how much do you make in a year? There's an and, right? Big error. So I don't know what you're asking me. Do you want to know how old I am or do you want to know how much I make in a year? Um, do you have soda with your mixed drinks? That, uh, question just doesn't make sense. I'm assuming they're talking about like an alcoholic drink or something else. It just, it's jargon. Makes no sense. <laughs> so typical issues in survey questions that I see all the time. Okay. Really quickly. I was going to just give a pre, a a. a quick preview of um, Qualtrics. Let me see if you can make sure you guys can see this. Um, screen. Okay, you can see this. Okay, cool. So this is Qualtrics, and I think all MSU research students have access to this. It's the most common survey software in the, mar in the industry. It's what we use at Spotify. I've used it at Goldman. I used it at my company before that. Very, very popular. Um, but this is basically where you go to program your survey, right? We talked about survey programming, um, but the reason I'm showing you now is because you can kind of get a feel for those things we talked about, right? Like, so here's how you, where you go to edit the question, right? So we could say like, you know, how old are you, right? Well, we could do this as a close into the question where we actually create bands, right? Like 18 to 34, 35 to 54, actually 35 to 55, 55 plus. Anyone see an issue with this? I hope you do because there's two 55s and um, that would lead to some confusing results. So this needs to be 54, right? So we can do it that way and it's gonna be multiple choice, right? Or we could go to text entry, say, how old are you? Okay, well, you know, then they can type in whatever they want here. However, they can still type in like, I am blank, right? We don't want that. So we want we would want to, you know, add some validation here. We want to say it needs to be, you know, um, number, right? And we can say minimum zero, maximum 100. And so all they could do in this question now is type in a number in between zero and 100. Um, similarly, in, in the, the uh, multiple choice option, you could say allow multiple answers, right? And so now that little 
box here changes from a circle to a square, indicating that you can actually check off multiple, right? Um, simply enough, we could say other. Please specify, which makes no sense for this age question, but you get the gist. And you can add this allow text entry box, which will add this little box below it. And then you could enter and say none of the above, right? We can make this one, it, see it automatically adds this little restriction box here, but you can actually go in here and say, make answer exclusive so that whenever you click it, it'll unselect all of these for your multiple choice question. Um, let me actually change this one a little bit to make it more, let's say like, what features do you like in modern products? You wanna say, please select all that apply, right? You could say, you know, interface, Simplicity, design, sure, mail is up. Um, okay, so now this makes a little more sense outside of the age thing, right? Now remember, we don't want interface to always come first, right? We want uh, these three to randomly move around. So you can go down here and you could say, you know, choice randomization. Um, you could go here to advanced randomization and say, I want these three to randomly pop populate here. We wanna keep these two, what we call anchored, right? Because we don't want these to move around because they will always be there. And then you save that and then we'll look at it in a second, but that's how it works. Um, we could also add a, what we call a matrix table, like I said, right? This is kind of like your scaled option, like, you know, not at all, somewhat, uh, very. How important are these features to you? Da, da, da. Right? Okay, so it's gonna give me some some other like options that AI just recognizes and, and offers. I'm gonna delete those just because for the sake of the example. Um, you can write your statements down here, you know, test one, test two, test three. Okay. So like I said earlier, I, I don't want to randomize these necessarily, um, but you could randomly um, flip the statements, right? So statement randomization here. And you could say, randomly flip the order of choices, right? That's one way you could do that. So that's helpful. Um, also on here, it's going to say mobile friendly, Right? Make sure you're always checking that box to make sure that it doesn't show in the unmobile friendly way. Um, and then, of course, when I go to preview this survey, hopefully this is still showing. Um, it's thinking about it. It's going to be some Spotify template. Um, you know, it's going to, every time I do this, it's going to randomize our options. But you can see over here on the right, that you know it looks different than what it looks like on my actual device, right? And then here it's showing that kind of accordion feature where you can like click down and do that. So yeah, it should help you test this on your mobile device, you know, in a in a certain way. So that's helpful. Last but not least, I want to just quickly show you um, what these kind of like data analysis tools look like, and specifically. Um, um, that multiple choice thing we talked about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to tools and I'm going to generate some test responses just so that we can have some fake dummy data in here. I'm going to do like 20. And it's going to literally like just fake populate um, data. Okay. It worked. So if we go in here to our results tab, Skip. I don't want to do that when I went to the old version because I'm an old dinosaur. Um, okay, so here's our please like all that apply question, right? And hopefully it loads. No results yet to show. That's not right. Okay, six came in. They all said on the above, it says that's not right. We'll get there, people. It's just taking some time. Whatever the case. Sure. 
whatever the case, you can see here, choice count. We talked about choice count. We don't like that. <laughs> we wanted to say response count. Um, so again, like it's kind of annoying because it's not working right now with this test data for some reason. I did not troubleshoot this ahead of time. Um, nonetheless, you can always see that where there where I'll tell you choice count or, or um, you know, respondent count. So you want to make sure that it's it's respondent count, TLDR. <laughs> Um, hopefully that makes some sense. Again, I wish this was populating better so that we could, um, we could truly look at this. It's just not working right now. It only has the six and none of the above. But anyways, all right. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. All right. So if you hold, hover over this, it just says choice count, right? We want to do, um, percentage of responses. So now it's out of 20, 20 people, how many selected none of the above? How many selected um, other? How many selected design? And then if I change it to be um, percentage of choices, it's going to get even smaller, just like in our example. And then in our, in our um, battery question here, right, you can see just showing you a simple bar chart here of everything we just, we just asked about. Um, all the different statements and their kind of corresponding um, scale points. All right, that will do it for today. Thank you everyone again for tuning in and let me know if you have any questions. Exam three will be up in just a few days and I will email you all with info. Thanks.